Hello, and welcome to part two in my Composing Harmonies series. These topics aren't necessarily meant to be cumulative from one to the next, so if you haven't seen part one, that's okay, keep watching this one, and then give part one a watch. And as I said in part one, if you're looking for a standard textbook harmony series, this might not be for you as I'm focused more on exploring harmony from a creative point of view, and my videos here are tailored more for composers. There will certainly be overlap with a lot of the Harmony textbook material, but I'm really not modeling this series on any standard systematic approach. So today's episode is on the concept of consonance and dissonance. There's always been a bit of confusion over these terms, and I don't claim to have a perfect definition for them. In fact, I think that there are multiple meanings depending on the context. But regardless of context, the terms consonance and dissonance refer to the relationship between two or more distinct pitches simultaneously sounded. From a more objective, scientific perspective, one might analyze the frequencies of simultaneous pitches and determine mathematical relationships. For instance, we can all agree that the octave sounds consonant, as we hear the same pitch one higher or lower than the other. The upper octave note is double the frequency of the lower octave, for example, in our modern tuning system, the A below middle C has a fundamental frequency of 220 Hz, and the octave above that is 440 Hz, or 2 times 220. And then if I add another 220, I get 660 Hz, which is almost precisely the E, an octave and a fifth above the first A. There are a number of consonant relationships between notes within the 12-tone equal-tempered system if you're strictly looking at mathematical relationships and ratios. Clearly, the octave and a fifth are objectively consonant in this definition of the word, and if you continue to examine the harmonic series, you'll notice that the thirds, both major and minor, have some correlation, and of course the inversion of those intervals, so fourths and sixths as well. So if looking for an objective definition of consonants and dissonance, you might say that the consonant pitches have a more simple mathematical relationship, and dissonant pitches are more distantly related mathematically, or have a more complex mathematical relationship. Obviously, our brains hear those relationships, and clearly the composers of the 18th century did as well. When studying the works of Mozart or Haydn, most scholars and music theorists agree upon somewhat strict definitions of consonance and dissonance within the 18th century contrapuntal context. Consonances could be classified as either perfect or imperfect, Octaves and fifths are perfect, and thirds and their inversions, both major and minor, are imperfect. Dissonances are the seconds and sevenths, both major and minor, as well as the tritone. And fourths are a special case, being the inversion of fifths. They can either be dissonant or consonant, depending on the context. Many scholars also discuss a gradient or degree of dissonance among these intervals. With major seconds and minor sevenths, being less dissonant than tritones, which are less dissonant than major sevenths and minor seconds. In the 18th century, there were implied rules about the use of consonance and dissonance, and some amount of dissonance was necessary to create conflict and resolution. Dissonant intervals had to be resolved properly, and the rules of voice leading were very much tied to diatonicism and the whole functional tonal system. For example, the 4th scale degree could form a tritone interval with the 7th scale degree over a dominant harmony. To resolve back to the tonic chord, the 7th will always resolve up to the tonic, and the 4th will always resolve down to the 3rd. There were many other rules in place, whether they were written out somewhere or just implied, that determined how dissonances were handled. In this short excerpt, obviously the tritone is treated as a dissonant interval that must be resolved properly, but even the perfect fourth is heard as a temporary dissonant moment, or a suspension that must be resolved by moving to a major third. So for a more subjective definition, some might argue that consonances sound nice, stable, and don't require resolution, while dissonances sound more harsh, unstable, and require proper resolution. Most music scholars try to avoid subjective words like nice or pleasant when analyzing music, 
and that's perfectly fair, but I think the words stable and unstable are worth exploring here. Once again, the context matters, and I think what sounds unstable or dissonant in one piece of music might sound very stable and consonant in another. While the tritone dissonances require proper resolution in the 18th century piano sonata, for example, in jazz or blues, on the other hand, that same interval is often considered stable. In fact, you could take any interval and make it sound consonant or dissonant, depending on the context, especially when you start looking at chords with more than two pitches at a time. For instance, a major second was considered dissonant in the 18th century, but I could add a few extra notes and make it sound extremely consonant and stable. There's a great moment in Sibelius's Seventh Symphony where the trombone has the second scale degree over a tonic chord. There's a great sense of finality and stability in this moment. Even though the note does resolve down to the tonic note of C, you feel like it doesn't really have to and it could just stay right there on the second. But of course, this piece was written in the 20th century, and as music changed and evolved, so did our ears and how we perceive different sonorities. The minor second is interesting because presented alone out of any context, most would argue that it sounds fairly dissonant. From a mathematical perspective, the harmonics of two adjacent semitones don't have a lot in common, so their relationship is fairly complex. But if I add a few notes to reveal a bit more about the harmonic language or context for which this minor second could be a part of, our ears sort of readjust in hindsight. Now everyone hears things differently, so some of you may still say this sounds dissonant, and that's perfectly fine. It really depends on a lot of things, including what music you listen to regularly or what music you like. If everyone agreed on what sounds pleasant or harsh, music would probably be pretty boring. I can take that very same interval, the minor second, and invert it, forming a major seventh. Because of the greater distance between pitches now, it's 11 semitones apart as opposed to one, we don't hear quite the same amount of dissonance as the minor second, even if those pitches used are the same. And if I start to add in additional notes, once again, any dissonances that did exist now sort of seem to vanish. This brings up an interesting point about how we perceive consonance and dissonance in music. Register, or the musical range, plays a fairly significant role. Proximity between pitches has an effect on how we recognize consonance versus dissonance. For instance, this excerpt sounds fairly consonant when written in this register. But when separated to the extreme ends of the piano, we hear it very differently. I think the same would be true for dynamics, rhythm, and even timbre. All of these play an important role in how we interpret music and how we perceive consonance or dissonance. So as soon as our definition departs from a mathematical basis, it becomes entirely contextual and subjective. It's really difficult to define, and perhaps ultimately it's not all that useful to us. I mentioned earlier how, in the context of 18th century classical music, consonant intervals had a sense of stability, and dissonant intervals were less stable and required resolution. I think the stability versus instability concept is actually more useful to composers writing music today. Stability and instability, or perhaps conflict or tension and resolution, are more broadly encompassing terms that better take into account the specific musical context. The composer gets to define those specifics either based on implicit rules within a pre-existing system, like 18th century classical music for instance, or through the composition process itself. A lot of the music that I write, especially orchestral music, borrows ideas, especially harmonically and texturally, from many different genres of music, and in doing so, I sort of form my own rules about harmonies and how they behave within any given piece. And within that piece, I create moments of stability and then moments of tension or conflict. How I organize those moments is a major aspect to the overall form of the piece and helps to give my music a shape with a beginning, middle, and end. The last thing that I'll mention today is related to something I mentioned in my part one video, and it's likely to be a theme throughout this series. As the composer, it can be very powerful when you only present a portion of your main idea, 
early on in a piece. In doing so, you sometimes force the listener to readjust their own interpretation, sometimes even in the span of a few measures. In this example, I purposefully chose a set of dissonant pitches to repeat again and again, creating tension. But like in my earlier examples, I start to paint more of the harmonic picture and your ears then readjust. In hindsight, the original pitches can be then re-examined and you may actually hear them as more consonant than you did before. So that's all for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be uploading a supplemental video on this topic to my Patreon page very shortly, and I'd love for you to check it out. In that video, I go into greater detail on this topic using some additional examples. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.